Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of drug abuse, sexual abuse, assault, and murder that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. On the morning of June 13, 1983, 26-year-old Gregory Travers stood beside his front window, shifting his gaze impatiently from his driveway to his watch. He was supposed to be at work at 7, but it was 6.50 and his ride still hadn't shown up. Gregory assumed the co-worker he carpooled with, Jerry Dean, had overslept. He dreaded the thought of walking to Jerry's apartment in the Texas heat, but with the minutes ticking by, he decided he'd better check. By the time he got to Jerry's apartment, Gregory was soaked in sweat. He fumed as he knocked hard on Jerry's door and rolled his eyes when there was no answer. Gregory tried the door and found it was unlocked, so he cautiously pushed his way inside. He could immediately hear the drone of a radio from somewhere, but no one responded when he called out. He made his way to the bedroom, ready to unload on Jerry but stopped dead in his tracks when he reached the doorway. His co-worker lay completely still on the floor, blood seeping from a gash on his head. It took a moment for Gregory to process the scene. In the creeping horror, he realized Jerry was dead. And he wasn't alone. Next to him, an unfamiliar woman was sprawled across the mattress. Gregory tried to place her, but he couldn't focus on her face. No matter how hard he tried to look away, his eyes kept coming back to the pickaxe buried in her chest. This is our first episode on Jerry Dean and Deborah Thornton, two strangers who met for the first time at a pool party in Houston, Texas. After a day of fun, Deborah accepted Jerry's invitation to spend the night at his place. Neither of them could have predicted that the casual hookup would end with both of them dead. On a bright summer morning in 1983, Houston investigators responded to Gregory Travers' frantic 911 call. He discovered the dead bodies of his friend, 27-year-old Jerry Dean, and an unknown woman on the floor of Jerry's apartment. When police arrived, they found a chaotic scene. The apartment was a mess of scattered tools and motorcycle parts. Dirty clothes littered the floor. Besides the mess, police also found evidence of a robbery. Jerry Dean's wallet was missing. So was the half-complete, custom-made motorcycle he'd been building in his living room. His 1974 El Camino had also vanished. Someone had ransacked the place. After turning the apartment upside down, detectives turned back to the bodies in the bedroom. They had been dead for several hours. Jerry Dean's body was hanging off of his mattress, half on the floor. The dead woman next to him, 32-year-old Deborah Thornton, lay flat on her back. As investigators prepared to transport the bodies from the crime scene, one of the officers removed the pickaxe embedded in Deborah's chest and set it aside to be collected as evidence. The savage nature of the double homicide raised many questions, but there were no doubts about the murder weapon. Within half an hour, a crowd of journalists had already gathered on the quiet street outside the apartment. They watched as two body bags were carried into a van and transported to the medical examiner. Autopsies soon revealed that each of the victims had been stabbed at least 20 times with the T-shaped pickaxe. Jerry Dean had also suffered a blow to the base of his skull with a blunt instrument. The slayings were shockingly brutal, but police hoped the extreme violence would narrow down their pool of suspects. Few people could have held such a severe grudge against the victims, but as investigators parsed through their backgrounds, they found no shortage of potential killers. The case was unusual. Jerry Dean and Deborah Thornton were practically strangers to each other and had little in common. It was pure chance that they happened to be together on the night of June 12, 1983. 
But somehow, both victims had a number of people in their lives who might have wanted them dead. Faced with a complicated web of hostile relationships, investigators struggled to untangle the bitter histories that led to the double murder. Deborah Thornton's life was tumultuous from the very beginning. Born in Columbus, Ohio in 1951, her childhood was troubling. When she was eight years old, her father, William List, was arrested for molesting teenage boys. Her parents divorced while he was in prison, and her mother, Harriet, remarried Air Force Staff Sergeant Homer Carlson. Deborah took her stepfather's last name, distancing herself from William. But the estrangement didn't last forever. Deborah's mother died in 1963, just before her daughter's 12th birthday. The loss likely left Deborah frightened and lonely, and it may have motivated her to reconnect with her biological father. After William was released from prison, he relocated to Texas. Deborah, a teenager at the time, decided to follow him there. What are you still doing up, Homer? It's late. Just sitting, thinking. About what? You. Are you sure about leaving, Deborah? This is your home. Homer. Dad. You know I'm grateful for everything you've done for me, and I'll always consider you my father. But I'm ready to grow up. It's time. I just worry about you going off on your own. Moving to a city where you don't know anybody? I won't be alone. William will be there. Deborah. I know what you're going to say, but everyone deserves a second chance, right? It's my blood. I need to try and get to know him. If this is really what you want, I'll support you. But I'll miss you, dear. If you change your mind, you'll always have a home here. Oh, Dad. I'll miss you, too. Deborah resettled in Houston, married at 18 years old, and had a son. All the while, she attempted to rebuild her relationship with her father. After moving to Texas, William had launched a company that manufactured oil rig trailers. Deborah took a job there and found it was lucrative work. Deborah was glad for the opportunity at first, but it wasn't long before her relationship with William deteriorated. His prison days were behind him, but rumors circulated that he wasn't exactly a changed man. William was known around Houston for picking up disadvantaged, often homeless, teenage boys. He brought them back to his mansion on Toddville Road and let the boys stay with him, but it was far from charity. William demanded his victims repay him in sex and manual labor. Deborah eventually caught on to William's secret and confronted him. Deborah. It's courteous to knock before entering a man's office. Do you know what everyone is saying about you? People say a lot of things about me. I know what's going on. I know why you keep bringing those boys home with you. I didn't realize you were such a prude. Oh, please. These are children. You're taking advantage of children. You're disgusting. So high and mighty. What are you going to do about it? Oh, I'll call them. No, you won't. You're going to mind your own business. And if I don't? <laughs> Sugar, you don't want to find out. William's behavior deeply disturbed Deborah. After working for him off and on for several years, she finally walked away. She resolved to stay out of her father's life for good and focus on her own from then on. There was a lot to straighten out. Deborah found a new position as a bookkeeper for a mortgage company. She divorced her first husband soon after. Then in 1981, 30-year-old Deborah got remarried to a 41-year-old heavy equipment operator named Richard Thornton. The marriage had its ups and downs. Neither one of them tended to back away from arguments. During a particularly tense fight in 1983, Richard ordered his wife to leave the apartment. Afterward, Deborah tried to make things right. She wrote Richard a love letter, begging him to put the fight behind them. But Richard wasn't in a forgiving mood. He told Deborah not to bother coming back that night. Hurt by her husband's rejection, Deborah grabbed a change of clothes and left. 
She walked outside her apartment to discover a party underway at the complex's pool. Looking to blow off some steam, she decided to join in. There, she caught the eye of 27-year-old Jerry Lynn Dean. Jerry and Deborah had never met before, but Jerry was immediately attracted to the tall, blonde stranger. Look at that. What's your name? Deborah. Nice to meet you. I like your legs, Deborah. Oh, you don't waste any time, huh? What's your name then, Mr. Smooth Talker? I'm Jerry Dean. You want a drink? Jerry, that is exactly what I need. At first, the flirting seemed like harmless fun. Deborah had no idea that the chance encounter would be the last one she'd ever have. When we return, Deborah is drawn into the turbulent life of Jerry Dean. And now, back to the story. On June 12, 1983, 32-year-old Deborah Thornton and 27-year-old Jerry Dean met at a pool party in Houston, Texas. Jerry was glad for the chance to relax and enjoy himself. For weeks, he'd been dealing with the drama of separating from his wife, Sean Jackson. Getting out of a bad marriage was bad enough, but to make things worse, Jerry also had to contend with her wild group of friends. Sean's assorted crew of bikers, drug dealers, and sex workers all hated Jerry, and they were eager to make trouble for him at a return. The animosity had gotten worse recently, but Jerry's problems with Sean began long before their marriage ended. In fact, the hostility went back two years, beginning on the first night Jerry met Sean's best friend, Carla Faye Tucker. At that time, Carla Faye Tucker was only 21 years old, but she had already weathered a long history of violence. She tried heroin for the first time at age 10. From then on, drugs were a constant presence in her life. A few years later, when Carla was 14, her mother pushed her into sex work to pay the bills. Carla went along with it because she wanted to make her mother proud of her, but it left her traumatized with a hair-trigger temper. Throughout her adolescence, Carla responded to every disagreement by escalating it into a violent brawl. She got married at 16, and during the few years they were together, she and her husband often got into heated fist fights. Carla was a petite woman, five feet, three inches tall, and only weighed about 100 pounds. But she was fierce. Years later, her ex-husband claimed that no man had ever hit him as hard as she did. As troubled as she was, Carla was also extremely protective of her friends and family. If they dated someone she didn't like, she never tried to hide her disapproval. If her best friend, Sean, got into trouble, Carla was always ready to take care of it. When Sean Jackson first started seeing Jerry Dean, she and Carla were roommates. One night when Jerry was sleeping over at their place, he dragged his Harley Davidson into the living room of their apartment instead of parking it outside. It was his prized possession and he didn't want anything to happen to it. Carla came home late that night, tired and already in a bad mood. When she walked in to find a motorcycle leaking oil on her living room rug, she went ballistic. Well, Sean, what a piece of work you brought home. This one's got no manners. Hey, get out of here. Is that your bike in my damn living room? Who are you? I'm the one paying rent here. I don't like having my home trashed by some worthless piece of garbage. Excuse me? Lady, you better quit screeching and settle down. Don't you dare give me orders. Or you'll be limping out of here. Sean, can you calm this friend down? Don't look at her. You're dealing with me now. Back off. That's it. Get out of my house. Are you kidding? It's the middle of the night. Don't make me embarrass you by throwing you out myself. Oh, that's funny. I'd like to see that. Okay, let's go. Hey, hey, stay away from me. I'm leaving, okay? Fine, I'm leaving. Carla hated Jerry on sight. The problem wasn't just the Harley in the living room. Carla liked motorcycles. She would have loved to have owned one herself. And she loved the tough guy biker culture. But Jerry Dean didn't strike her as a tough guy. 
He stood five foot five and barely weighed 140 pounds. Carla thought he was puny. He had a bad attitude. He didn't deserve a Harley, and he didn't deserve Sean. Carla tried to get Sean to dump Jerry, but they stayed together. Jerry might have even tried harder to make Sean happy out of spite to prove her best friend wrong. Despite Carla's protests, Sean and Jerry moved in together a few months later. Carla moved out of the apartment and into a house in Northwest Houston with her boyfriend, 37-year-old Daniel Garrett. Now, five and a half miles away, Carla had a little distance from Jerry Dean, but the hostility between them didn't cool. Sean's friendship with Carla remained a sore subject with Jerry, too. At one point, Carla convinced Sean to come with her on a road trip to New Orleans. They planned to follow a rock band on tour. Sean went while Jerry stewed back at home, bitter about being left behind. Sean and Carla had traveled the country before, following bands like the Almond Brothers and the Eagles. But Jerry hadn't known Sean then. As far as he was concerned, Carla had pressured his girlfriend into becoming a groupie. When Sean got back from the trip, Jerry made a show of stabbing holes into some pictures of Carla, which Sean kept in a photo album at their place. One of the photographs Jerry destroyed was an image of Carla's mother, who had died a few years earlier. When Carla heard about it, she was incensed. For all of her mother's faults, Carla idolized her, and those pictures were the only memories she had left. She could never forgive Jerry for what he did. He had to go. Once again, she tried to interfere in her friend's relationship to no avail. In February of 1983, Jerry and Sean got married, but Carla never gave up her grudge. A month after the wedding, Sean stopped by Carla's place to pick up a jacket that she'd left there. Carla was fine with Sean stopping by as long as she didn't bring her husband around. When Sean told her that Jerry was waiting outside, Carla flew out the front door in a rage. She punched Jerry in the face, breaking his glasses. Hey, what are you... Ow! I told you you're not welcome around here. Didn't I tell you? Are you crazy? I'm, I'm bleeding. Serves you right. Sean, you better drag your man out of here before he really gets hurt. Sean had to rush Jerry to the emergency room to remove bits of glass from his eye. At that point, Carla and Jerry were in an all-out war with no end in sight. Their dispute outlasted Jerry and Sean's marriage. At the beginning of June 1983, just four months after their wedding, Sean and Jerry broke up. Sean showed up at Carla's house with bruises on her face and a split lip. She told Carla that Jerry had hit her, so she had left him for good. Now, both women were furious at Jerry, but Carla's rage turned to glee when Sean also revealed she'd gotten a bit of revenge before escaping the apartment. She'd swiped Jerry's ATM card from his wallet. Sean and Carla used the card to withdraw $460 from Jerry's account, everything he had. Then they went on a shopping spree. When Jerry found out, he called his mother-in-law irate. What kind of daughter did you raise? Do you know what she and her friends did? I'm not getting involved in your marriage problems, Jerry. She better watch out. You threatening my daughter? She's a thief. The police are going to be after her, you hear me? Next time, I'm calling the cops. Jerry vowed to file charges against Sean for the theft, but he reportedly had even worse plans for Carla. According to rumors, he scrounged up $300 to hire a man to shoot Carla in the face with a flare gun. He apparently hoped to burn and disfigure her for life. Carla laughed at the idea. She thought Jerry was too weak to go through with the plot. Still, she didn't appreciate being threatened. She complained to her boyfriend, Daniel Garrett, that Jerry was overdue for a punishment. He's a wife beater and a chicken. Someone ought to bust his head open. I'm not saying you're wrong, but it seems like a waste of time. He's a waste of life. Come on, Carla. Just forget about Jerry Dean. Don't tell me to forget. After everything he's gotten away with. After the way he treated Sean. Every time I picture his little rat face, I get so mad. 
Going to really lose it on him one of these days. He'll get what's coming to him, sooner or later. I know he will. I'm the one who's going to see to it. Carla wanted to make Jerry Dean pay. Though she didn't know exactly how she was going to do it, she started laying the groundwork for her revenge. At some point in early June, while she was doing laundry, Carla found Sean's old house keys in the pocket of her dirty jeans. She held on to them. Sean didn't notice. She didn't need the keys anymore now that she was living with Carla. Carla figured the keys would come in handy, somehow. But she didn't spend too much time planning out the specifics. She was having too much fun partying. On Saturday, June 11th, she threw a birthday bash for her sister Carrie. They celebrated with drugs, group sex, tequila, and barbecue. The celebration continued through the weekend. By Sunday evening, June 12th, most of the partygoers had gone. Carrie, a sex worker like Carla, had an appointment with a client. Sean made other plans. Then only three remained in the house. Carla, her boyfriend Daniel, and another friend, Jimmy Librant. The trio sat around drinking and doing drugs. Carla didn't usually shoot speed, she said, because it made her wired, and her personality was already hyper enough. But that weekend, she didn't turn anything down. She spent the night doing meth, cocaine, marijuana, and a variety of pills mixed with alcohol. The higher she got, the more fixated Carla became on Jerry Dean. Here, Jerry Dean is trying to build himself a new motorcycle. I guess he needs a big hog between his legs to compensate for what ain't there. Babe, who cares what he's doing? How much you think his bike is worth? I don't know. A couple hundred? What if we took it from him? Sold it for parts? Sean told me that thing is like his baby. Can you imagine his face if we stole it? Oh, what good would that do? It would make me feel better. Isn't that enough of a reason? <laughs> oh, you're a wild woman, Carla. I thought you loved that about me. Jerry had no idea that his estranged wife's friends were conspiring against him. On that very day, he was busy trying to pick up Deborah Thornton at a pool party. You like bikes? Sure, they're cool. You should stop by my place. I could show you the ride I'm building. I don't know. Come on. Aren't you sick of this party yet? Are you kidding? I needed this. My husband's trying to make me miserable, and I'm not about to give him the satisfaction of wallowing. Oh, why didn't you say so? If you really want to piss your husband off, I have a few suggestions. <laughs> Let me take a wild guess. Come back to my place. I don't think so. You know, the best way to get even with a man is to make him jealous. <laughs> I admit, I'm tempted. Is that a yes? <sighs> yeah, it is. Let's get out of here. After spending a few hours at the pool party, Deborah followed Jerry Dean back to his place. There, they spent the last night of their lives together. Coming up, Houston police desperately search for the culprit behind the brutal double murder. Now, back to the story. In June of 1983, 32-year-old Deborah Thornton and 27-year-old Jerry Dean met for the first time. They had instant chemistry. Both of their previous relationships were falling apart amid nasty disputes and grudges. They found an easy comfort in each other. On June 12, 1983, Deborah and Jerry went home together after getting to know each other at a pool party. That night, Jerry's neighbors noticed that it was a little noisier than usual in his apartment, but they didn't hear any screams or gunshots, nothing that suggested violence. The next morning, Jerry was scheduled for an early job, installing home alarm systems for a security company. He was supposed to pick up his co-worker, Gregory Travers, and head to work around 7 a.m. Gregory got worried when Jerry didn't show up, 
He walked to his friend's apartment and discovered a stomach-churning scene. He hurried back home to call the authorities. Police immediately went to work identifying the victims. When they realized that Deborah Thornton was a married woman found dead in the bed of another man, her husband became suspect number one, especially given that they'd fought the day before. But Richard Thornton had been home with his children at the time of the murders and was quickly illuminated as a suspect. Next, investigators turned their attention to another member of Deborah's family. Her father, William List, was allegedly covering up all sorts of scandalous behavior, not just his predatory attacks on teenage boys, but when police dug into William's background, they discovered that he was under investigation for tax evasion and his daughter had been subpoenaed to testify against him. As one of William's former employees, Deborah may have been sitting on a mountain of incriminating evidence against her father. Her testimony could have been disastrous for the millionaire. Deborah's brother described their father as a malicious, volatile alcoholic who used his wealth to exploit others. Some of William's victims later said that he didn't just prey on them for sex. He was also cruel and sadistic. He enjoyed making them suffer. Given William's horrifying reputation, it was easy for police to imagine that he was capable of murder. Maybe William hired someone to kill Deborah in an attempt to silence her before his IRS hearing. They quickly pursued that lead. Mr. List, I'm a detective with the Houston PD. What now? We just wanted to go over a few things. Are you detectives slow or just incompetent? I've already answered your questions. I apologize. I'm sick of these constant interrogations. You should be out looking for my daughter's killer instead of harassing me. That's exactly what we're trying to do, sir. It would go a lot smoother if you'd cooperate. Get out of my office. Did you and Deborah argue at all before she died? Out. Now. I'll be back. Not without a warrant. Stay off my property. Police looked into William List in the weeks following the murders but ultimately couldn't find any hard evidence connecting him to his daughter's death. Their investigation into Deborah Thornton's family was inconclusive. But Deborah wasn't the only one with enemies. Police were also looking into Jerry Dean's background, and 23-year-old Carla Faye Tucker's hatred of Jerry was no secret. It wasn't long before investigators discovered their feud. When police learned that Carla's punch had sent Jerry to the hospital a few months before, they hauled her into the police station. Carla agreed to have her fingerprints taken, although it hardly mattered. Evidently, investigators weren't able to collect any clear prints from the crime scene. Carla also agreed to take a polygraph test, but then changed her mind before going through with it. Apparently, her boyfriend Daniel convinced her it was a bad idea. Authorities let Carla off, but made regular surprise visits to her home. They also stopped by the bar where Daniel Garrett worked and repeatedly questioned the pair, hoping one of them might slip up and say something incriminating. But no matter how many times they called up Carla, she stayed uncharacteristically cool. The investigation didn't seem to worry her at all. She continued on with her life of drugs, sex, and partying unabated. How can you be having a good time right now with the cops banging on the door every day? Forget about them. Cops are always digging around. They've got nothing on me. They know you beat up on Jerry. If they knew half the crap I've done, I'd be in jail already. But they don't. They're just dogs chasing their tails. We should at least be laying low, not throwing a party. Life is a party, babe. Can we take a break and go over what we're going to say next time they come around? Uh, Daniel, you worry too much. Damn, Carla. This is serious. <laughs> Carla didn't believe the police had any evidence tying her to the murders, and she was right. Detectives later said that while they were interested in Carla and Daniel, the two weren't considered prime suspects. Weeks dragged on and no arrests were made. A frustrated sergeant with the Houston PD called it a complex case with a lot of suspects. He said police didn't know where it was going to end up. 
as the officers continued their investigation, word about the murders got around to a Houston homicide detective named J.C. Mosier. Detective Mosier realized he was somewhat connected to the case. He was close friends with Daniel Garrett's ex-wife. He was also acquainted with Daniel's family, having grown up in the same neighborhood. When he learned Daniel had been questioned as a suspect, he was surprised. As far as Detective Mosier knew, Daniel seemed like a decent guy. The officer wondered how the bartender had gotten mixed up with a character like Carla Tucker, much less become a suspect in a murder investigation. Detective Mosier wasn't technically assigned to the pickaxe murder, but his curiosity was piqued. He placed a phone call to Daniel's ex-wife, asking her to let him know if she heard anything suspicious about him. She agreed to ask around. On July 18, 1983, about five weeks after the murder, Detective Mosier's seeds bore fruit. That night, the Houston Police Department received a call from Daniel's brother, Douglas Garrett. I have information about the pickaxe murders. Uh, let me talk to Detective J.C. Mosier. I think you're mistaken. Detective Mosier isn't handling that case, but I can put you through to the lead investigators. That'll be detectives... No, no. Nobody else. I, I have to talk to Mosier. He knows me, and he knows the killer, too. He just doesn't realize it yet. What? Who's calling? Just put me through to Mosier! Hold, please. By the end of Douglas and Mosier's conversations, the detective had identified not one, but two suspects in the brutal slaying of Jerry Dean and Deborah Thornton. Detective Mosier was unsettled. He knew he had to act quickly. If Douglas Garrett was telling the truth, the two murderers were already plotting to kill again. <laughs> 